G'day and welcome back to Craig's Workshop. I've been doing a lot of fabrication jobs recently and I've decided that a belt grinder would be really useful to own. So I've done a bit of research and decided that Jeremy Schmidt's design is the one to go for. But I'm building mine on a budget, using the scrap pile where possible but without compromising on quality. I hope you'll come along and enjoy the ride. Some of this material is very rough as you can see and it will need a bit of prep work before we can get started. So I spent a bit of time cutting it down to size and de-rusting it on the wire wheel and just making it easier to handle and work with. And as you can see that results in quite a big pile of parts. This is about 6 weeks work compressed into about 20 minutes so this video is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour but I'll explain as much as I can in the time given. These are some sides for the main frame tube and they get rebated. The horizontal cut didn't come out very accurately but when I tried doing it vertically with a strong back to prevent any flex I managed to get an accurate cut. Measuring with a depth mic just to see how the cut went and then marking out for a locking screw hole which can then be threaded. These threads are M10. Then I decided to vary from Jeremy's plans by creating some weld preps which I did with a ball nose end mill because I didn't have a chamfer bit to start with. The shoulders that I created allowed me to weld the tubes together without using shims and clamps on the square bars. Now I'm machining the legs, braces and feet. and now I'm using Stefan's deburring technique. Here are the braces being chamfered and that's how they came out. Four of these braces per foot. Then the feet themselves. These are a bit of 8mm plate with a couple of holes and a chamfer and some rounded over corners. I'd never used a round over bit before on steel but they work really well and that's how those came out. Initially the welding went really badly, I didn't realise I had a kink in my gas line and I was really struggling to make the welder work well. So all of these welds needed to be machined out again which was a pain and that took up extra time. But as you'll see the welds went up in quality as we go along and as I become more practised again. For these parts the chamfer mill had arrived so I used that and it worked great to provide some weld prep for the feet and legs. There's a whole lot of clamping, jigging, tacking and welding throughout this project. Lots of checking angles and all that kind of stuff. Here are the two main legs and the main body tube. The main tube has a bar that comes in and out and allows a table to be clamped in place. And this 45 degree hole and weld nut allow me to mount a locking knob for that bar. Here we are splitting a square tube in half to make the motor mount arm. Milling those sawn edges. And here we are cutting out some of the hinges which go between the tilting tube and the main tube. This is my indicator holder which I made in a previous video. I'll put a link in the corner. There's a fair bit of rotary table work on this project because we're cutting a lot of radius type cuts and a curved slot and some rounded ends. This little Morse taper plug thing has been useful to me. It allows me to centre things up on a 5mm stub and if I need a bigger hole on the finished part I can easily indicate on the hole later and open it up. I really enjoy the handwork part of these projects. If you do too, please click the like button. Thanks. Those parts came out quite well. 
The motor mount plate needs four holes in the corners and those need to be threaded M10. Again, I'm varying from the plans. I think they ask for clearance holes for nuts and bolts, but holes threaded with studs allows me to hang the motor off the plate for easy installation. Here we're jigging up some spacers and offsets to get these hinges locked in in an accurate position. Lots of tacks first and then filling in the welds after. Back to the motor mount tube now, which needed an end cap. That gets attached to the tilting tube, and that has the motor mount plate attached to the rear of it. That was just a fusion weld. I didn't want any built up weld, which gets in the way of mounting the motor, which has a flat base. Here we're marking out the tracking and tension arm. Never mill what you can bandsaw. I rough it out with the bandsaw and then mill up to the lines with the mill. And I use the lines to set the angle of the part in the vise with a parallel or an adjustable parallel. Again with the handwork and the rotary table. This is the very far end of the tracking and tension lever which has a spring mount later. Practicing some more hand filing here and chamfering and so on. And that's how the part came out. Quite a few operations on that one, but it worked out well. This is the tracking fork. It needed a hole which was then opened up into a slot, and it's milled with a couple of radii, so it ends up as a nice smooth fork shape. That gets smoothed out and chamfered. And ready for welding. Here we're working on the handle. I'm using Gary Flex abrasive rubber, which I quite like. I think it's similar to Kratex. I tapered that handle, drilled and tapped it, parted it off and chamfered the top. I think the plans call for a pipe welded onto a coupling nut, but with the machines here, I thought a solid one would be nice. This is the tension post and that's welded onto the tilting tube. That provides the support for the tracking and tension lever and the tracking wheel. Finishing off adding some of those smaller parts to the lever now. And there's the fork that we made earlier. The welds are getting better as I go through the project, which is always the way. <laughs> Just testing the tilt now and adding the spring. That adds tension to the belt, of course. And these are some little nubs that allow a three-point contact for the platen face. That gives me a way of squaring the platen to the machine perfectly. And here's a major cock up. I didn't have that part deburred, or maybe I needed an aluminium rod on one face. Luckily I didn't damage the end mill and the part was salvageable. I was able to file away any high points so I could keep machining it. This is the platen spline, and this has notches cut into it which gives clearance for the platen wheels. This is the platen face which sits on those three nubs. There needs to be some clearance holes in the spine to allow the face to be squared without the studs and holes influencing the squareness. Here's that damage again, but it goes inside a weld joint so no one will ever know. I found the third hand handy, funny that, and this thermometer saved me from quite a few impatience related injuries. Here I'm using the square body as a parallel to pick up the 123 block above that weld to help with alignment. Just checking that it's come out as straight, square and flat as I want, and thankfully it has. Here I'm welding the arm onto the platen, and then we clamp the arm in the mill vise to help mill those three nubs exactly square. Testing those on the surface plate with a square and a light, and I'm very happy with how it came out. There are some studs that get welded onto the platen face, and those are checked for square, and then we're on to the table holder frame.
This is a kind of angular piece that wraps down and around the front of the machine using a tube to hold another heavy bar. It's quite a complicated piece and I think if I made another I'd use a mitered tube, but this was the design. There's that tube that I mentioned and here's another cock up. I got my maths wrong, that's maths with an S. The tube is basically the same style and design as the first two larger tubes, but obviously the welding went a lot better after fixing that gas line. Back to the table holder arm and I'm just trying to square this up and weigh the thing down so that I can add a load of tacks in the right places and then fill out the welds and close the shape up. I can use my bar bender here to bend some 3mm flat to close up the top of the table holder. I got it wrong, so I tried again and it was a better fit the second time. Let's trim that off on the bandsaw, just a quick cut. Then we'll tack that in place and fill in the welds. Now I had another minor problem with argon gas at this point. I changed torches and I think the old torch possibly is leaking and pulling in air. So I'll change back to the new one and it's all good. Here's how the mounting plate for that table holder tube comes out. And we're now making components to go underneath the table. There's a frame and a flat plate, and the flat plate gets machined. And a big notch that fits around the platen. This gives me room to work around the side of the belt. Mostly that gets band sawed and then we clean it up for the mill. and we refine that cut using some hand files, just to give us a nice surface. This will get chewed up by the belt, but you know, it might as well be nice on day one. Rounding over again. Dressing some of these edges with a hand file. I don't need to do this, but I like doing it, so I'm going to. And that came out quite nicely. Now we start to build up the structure of the supports underneath the table. And all of this stuff obviously has to be dead square, so there's a lot of measuring between welds just to make sure we get these parts straight and square. And the tacking is done carefully and in a certain order. There are no heavy welds between the table surface and the frame, because that bends the table surface of course, so the table is only lightly held to the frame. Now putting the motor on and we have another cock up. The motor plate is on the wrong way around. Can I cut it off and fix it in time? We're running out of time here, I don't know. I felt terrible at this point. All those nice welds and having to slice into them and grind them down. I'd avoided using an angle grinder so far in the project and I felt really good about that. But this kind of surgery really requires an angle grinder. Thankfully there's enough of that original face left, which was my square reference. I'd messed up the edge of that plate though, so that involved cleaning it up and filling in a small divot. Again, not really necessary, but I like doing things cleanly if I can, so I'm filing that weld down and dressing it up and trying to make it look undamaged. I think it came out okay. Then getting it back into position, again some original reference surface material here which allows us to get it flat, square and parallel and then add some welds. Try hanging the motor again and yes, it works this time. Thank goodness for that. I lost a couple of hours there. 
Now I'm making the wheels for mine as a money saving exercise. I had a few lumps of aluminium in stock and I had to buy one but this worked out a lot cheaper still. The main Australian knife making place wants about 500 bucks for a set of these so I thought I can do it for cheaper. I had the 50mm in stock and I had a chunk that I bought from the recycling place and I had to buy a new piece for the drive wheel. They are all turned and faced and bored 3 quarter inch as accurately as possible in one operation which I measured with telescoping gauges. I got all four to that stage and now it's time to make a stub arbor. This is a click spring style super glue arbor which I've never tried before. So I put the blank in the chuck and turned it down to about three or four thou below three quarters. Sorry I'm using imperial but it was an imperial shaft on the motor. A bit of solvent to clean the bores to help the glue stick and also the arbour. I found that more super glue was better than not enough and a good 10 minute wait in my workshop worked well and a bit of moisture from my breath before I stuck the wheel on really helped it set. Okay facing these to length now making sure they're all 55 mil plus or minus a few hundredths. Two of these wheels need a crown, so I'm putting a two and a half degree cut on using the compound slide. I'm making sure I've got enough forward travel on the compound. And I'm locking the carriage and I'm turning that crown on the OD. That's gone quite smoothly. I'm using aluminium WNMG inserts here. Now I swing it back two and a half degrees the other way doing the cut backwards made for a slightly smoother cut and scotch bright made for an even smoother cut. A few chamfers and then some bearing pockets. Now I'm trying to machine the OD and the bearing pockets and the outside face all in one operation. That's the idea of this glue stub arbor. It gives me access to all three at once. Five of the six bearing pockets were a light press fit or you might say a transitional fit but one slid in easily but with no play afterwards. I'm happy enough with that. I could have bored and sleeved it if it was loose, but it was okay. Now this part doesn't even need to get to 60C to come off the arbor easily. That's just about the limit of hand holding temperature. Here I'm making a broach bushing. I needed to broach the drive wheel so it can be keyed to the motor shaft and that needed me to make a 3 16 inch B style broach bushing. I roughed out this top hat shape and I used a 4mm end mill and I walked in the width to get that brooch to slide just right. And a tiny bit of fettling with the needle files just to let that brooch slide easily. You'd be amazed at how many times I pinched my fingers pushing this brooch in while it was tight and while I was getting the fit right. Not once did it cross my mind to push it in backwards. Just setting up a soft place for the brooch to land and onto the brooching. After I realised I only had one shim I stopped when I ran out of cut and I made a couple of shims. I went through my shim stock pile, cut a piece of length and width, tapped it flat and tapped the end over. Simple stuff, you don't really need the explanation. And doing that allowed me to get the keyway cut fully to depth. I went for half a mil deeper than necessary and that seems to work well. Now I'm using the key and a parallel to line up the drive pulley for a grub screw hole.
Now I'm setting up for a clearance hole for the shank of the tap. Tapping the remainder of the hole. And now I can lock the wheel onto the motor arbor. That works quite well and it seems to turn very true. I'm very pleased with that. Again, with the other wheels, I think five of the six were press fit. Everything's had a wire brush and an acetone clean and been masked off and it's getting a coat of etch primer. None of the bearing faces or sliding faces get painted. And in the interest of time and cost, I'm spraying this with a hammered finished metal paint from a can. Now we start the assembly. The tilting tube attaches to the main tube. I use lock nuts where necessary. And a lock knob controls the tilt. The platen spine with its arm and the locking knob for that. And the platen face which sits on those three nubs. This is the table holder tube and the table itself locked into place. The tracking and tension arm which gets done up with a little bit of drag on it. This is the tracking pivot. It's on top of the tension arm. And that has the handle which goes on top. The handle does the tracking, tension and gives you something to hold on to while tilting the machine. That one handle and the four locking knobs do everything. This is the tracking wheel and that spins true as well. They all spin true, spoiler alert. This is the top platen wheel. And the bottom platen wheel. And the motor studs or screws that I talked about earlier. This motor is pretty scruffy and it's quite old, so I gave it a Dulux restoration. I cleaned up the shaft, gave it a solvent wash, removed any rust, gave it some etch primer and some flat black paint. Just to make it worthy of a thumbnail photo, you understand. The belt I've chosen is a ceramic 80 grit belt. We'll see which ones I end up using, but I'm sure over time I'll try a few out. And here are some shots of the assembled machine. There we go, that's the finished unit. The only thing left is a test. So I'm knocking the corners off a piece of 10mm plate and it's done in seconds. So much faster than a file. And of course I can guarantee that the cut is square to the table, which is really nice. Radiusing is easy. And if you use thin stuff, this thing just eats it. It's a hungry machine. This is going to be a super useful tool. I'm not planning to become a knife maker, but I'm not ruling out making one in future. This is mostly a machine for fabricating and deburring and shaping. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.